today what we are going to discuss is what's happening in the gaza strip uh since saturday the 7th of october 2023 um uh, it's absolutely tragic unbelievable unprecedented the word which has been often used to describe what has been happening uh for a simple reason because in the last 75 years since israel has been in existence never has um uh, something like this ever happened which has resulted in the death of close to 1000 israelis on israeli soil on any given single day so uh, what 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 makes this entire episode a completely different one as compared to what has happened in the past is the loss of life the unbelievable phenomenal loss of life uh most lives that have been lost have been lost in a situation wherein they least anticipated that this is something that could happen to them the reason for this loss of life is uh this uh unprecedented sort of invasion of israeli territory out of the gaza strip that has been perpetrated by hamas um hamas hamas fighters uh, uh streamed out of um the gaza strip uh which is a small piece of territory um, almost 25 kilometers by uh, 10 kilometers so it's 25 kilometers long 10 kilometers wide almost uh, if if one tries looking for it on a map of the world it looks like a uh, sort of quadrilateral and out of this um you you have fighters streaming out um uh, fully armed well prepared uh, seems like months of training and months of uh, groundwork has gone into deciding as to what exactly needs to be done and when it actually would be done uh, what what is the way by which it would be done um so every everything seems to be in place if if one looks at uh, the propaganda videos that hamas has released uh, it seems that uh, they were well prepared for this sort of an episode uh so they stream out of the gaza strip and um they they take recourse to israeli territory by land by air and by sea uh and and there they uh, go about butchering uh israeli citizens in a situation where in most least anticipated something like this to happen to them uh so they move on into the towns in the villages and the settlements around the gaza strip uh in in um southern israel and um you you have um settlements and villages being invaded where they are moving in and they are trying to um shoot down people um mayhem absolute mayhem all over the place uh approximately 1000 israelis have been killed 150 of them uh have have been uh apprehended and uh um, hamas hamas uh, 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 workers have taken them back to the gaza strip and have possibly uh taken them deep into the ground uh b- b- below uh b- b- below the ground uh where now they are being held hostage and it's this hostage thing that adds a completely different dimension to this entire conflict uh because just as you'd never had in the past a thousand israelis been killed on israeli soil on any given single day you never had again in the past something like this happening wherein uh israeli citizens apprehended on israeli soil uh carted away to uh, a palestinian territory have been held hostage on such vast numbers uh they they are all sorts of uh israelis they are men they are women they are children they are the old they are the young they they are soldiers they are professionals they are, they they have all all sorts of backgrounds and uh this makes the entire thing more tricky in terms of uh what what needs uh to be done militarily in 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 the gaza region um sort of gets hedged by the fact that uh hamas is holding on to 150 uh, israelis um there is one section in uh the israeli cabinet um and the israeli defense forces which is like very clear that uh we shouldn't um be a lot bothered about the hostages because that would automatically in some way or the other um tone down the response uh that israel needs to deliver uh we we should not be worried if there is more loss of life as far as israelis are concerned and we should move in and deliver uh hamas a body blow of of the sort that would see to it that the organization would never ever uh, rise up to doing something like this ever again 
um obviously the questions are why this why now why uh, something like this um there are a lot of people who are comparing this uh, in israel to and outside israel to something like israel's 9-11 moment there is the obvious comparison which has been made to the yom kippur war for a very simple reason because uh, october 2023 happens to be the 50th anniversary uh, month of the yom kippur war Almost a uh, 24-hour gap is what uh, separates the start of the Yom Kippur War and um, uh, there's this uh, incidence that has been perpetrated in the uh, regions of South Israel by uh, Hamas. So uh, the, 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 there's an obvious sort of way by which people try making comparisons, uh, irrespective of the fact that uh, the Yom Kippur War was a conflict between uh, nations, nation states independent nation states and did not involve a nation state on one hand and a non-state actor on the other hand uh, which this episode is so sort of the, this this makes things slightly different again as far as 9-11 is concerned uh, the sheer brazenness the sheer unpredictability uh, is is obviously what one recalls when one looks at this episode and when one tries to make sense of 9-11 except for the fact that um, uh, uh, the, the the people who came to the united states uh, to perpetrate 9-11 uh, were not people who were streaming from a nearby territory. They, they came uh, a, a vast distance, almost from across the oceans um, and, and settled in the United States for some period of time before they perpetrated that attack. So obviously, uh, just as there sound to be similarities, there are obvious dissimilarities between the two episodes. But then, as um, someone in the Jerusalem Post uh, sort of presciently tried to make a point, um, it seems that uh, there's another episode that happened 80 years ago, which bears an uncanny resemblance to this one, and that's the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So what happened uh, in, in uh, Israel on the 7th of October 2023 sounds very similar to uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So uh, uh, Poland falls to the Nazis in 1939 in the month of September. Um, Jews from across um, uh, Poland um, sort of have been forced into ghettos as far as the big cities are concerned. So every Polish city has its big ghettos. Um, the ghettos are mostly walled, they have barbed fences and within it um, uh, there is a Jewish communal life that flourishes. Um, Jews cannot leave the ghettos or get into the ghettos without the explicit permission of uh, the Nazis who are manning and who are policing all the entry and exit points into the ghetto. Um, Jews are subjected to uh, indignities. Uh, to starvation, to all sorts of humiliation, all sorts of acts by which um, you can perpetrate um, all, all, all manner of atrocities against them. Um, they they uh, routinely get killed in what seems to be is um, some sort of uh, uh, Nazi way of passing your time uh, when, when you're policing the ghettos. So for, for minor infractions, um, heavy punishments are inflicted um, and all in all, uh, life is unbearable as far as the Jews in the ghettos are concerned. And then there comes 1943 when the Jews in the Warsaw ghetto attempt an uprising. Uh, so they break through the walls, uh, they, they manage to bring in weapons and they manage to storm some, some of these uh, security installations outside the ghetto which are manned by the Nazis. Uh, of course, the, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising is uh, badly, badly uh, sort of uh, extinguished by the Nazis. It's completely eliminated. Um, and, and then what is perpetrated against the Jews is an unbelievable violence, um, the likes of which can only be described as epic. Um, so uh, for, for um, a lot of people in Israel, uh, who know their history well and who know the history of what happened to the Jewish people well, uh, this moment sort of is a resemblance to that. Uh, 2005 is 
uh, when when uh, Hamas wins the Palestinian National Council elections, uh, the Palestinian Legislative Council elections, um, there have been no elections which have been conducted since then. Um, and, and you have this division between the West Bank and the Gaza. Um, the, the Palestinians, uh, Hamas manages, Hamas wins the elections and Hamas manages to drive out uh, the officials and the fighters of the Fatah faction of the PLO out of Gaza and thereby monopolizes all power in the Gaza Strip. 2006, the Ariel Sharon government um, decides to disband Gaza and to uh, walk away from it. Uh, Jewish settlements are disbanded. Almost four synagogues are, are uh, uh, systematically uh, sort of brought down uh, with this idea that all traces of Jewish life in the Gaza Strip have got to come to an end because the, uh, the, the uh, Israeli state is withdrawing from Gaza. So uh, the Israeli state withdraws from Gaza, maintains its existence as far as the seven entry points are concerned, uh, through which goods and uh, stuff can move in Gaza from Israel, uh, and then maintain a very close sort of watch over Gaza's airspace, over Gaza's coastline, uh, effectively for most Palestinians, turning Gaza into an open-air prison, uh, which is home to almost 23, uh, up, up, uh, 23 lakh um, uh, Palestinians, 2.3 million Palestinians, um, and, and uh, life goes on. Um, they are subjected to indignities, they are subjected to inhumanity, uh, they are subjected to all manner of uh, atrocities. Uh, 2023, the year is not yet out and in the West Bank, Israel has already managed to finish off something like 275 Palestinians. In Gaza, uh, Palestinians are routinely harassed are absolutely on uh, 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 almost almost normal basis subjected to all sorts of indignity and humiliation that uh, Israel can subject them to. And since December 2022, when this new government has come into power, uh, which carries uh, uh, as members of this coalition, uh, Israel's most extreme right wing parties, uh, the fate of the Palestinians has become much more difficult. So as, as the Hamas propaganda video makes a point that, uh, well, why, why did we do this? Um, so we are trying to, in some way or the other, avenge for the indignities and the humiliations perpetrated against us and our people. And we are trying to, in some way or the other, protest against what Israelis are trying to do with the Al-Aqsa Masjid. Uh, uh, Masjid Al-Haram, uh, the Al-Aqsa uh, Al Mosque. Mas is at the center, at almost the center of all sorts of um, Palestinian identity in terms of uh, who are the Palestinian people, in terms of um, their spirituality, their beliefs, uh, absolutely stunning mosque located in an uh, absolutely wonderful corner of Jerusalem uh, with a with, um, legacy and a history that goes all the way to the 7th century of the Common Era. Is, is, um, uh, uh, it, it's not just a shrine, it's, it's a completely different sort of place for most Palestinians. And what has been happening with um, uh, most Israelis over the last couple of years has been a deliberate effort being made to sort of change the character of this place itself. Uh, to try emphasizing that, uh, well, much before the mosque came into existence, it was a site of Jewish worship. It was a part of the temple which was destroyed by the Roman emperors. Uh, it was a place which was holy uh, to the Jewish people and hence its Jewish character should be restored. This is despite the fact that most Orthodox Jews refuse to um, legitimately sanction a change in character as far as this place itself is concerned. So for most of them, it is a mosque, it is a place of worship of a different religion and uh, one should be patient enough uh, to let God have his own way. That's at least how a lot of Orthodox Jews look at it. Uh, and a lot of uh, nationalist Jews 
of a certain fanatic bent of mind uh, of, of the type that form Israel's government as of now are hell-bent on using the mosque as, as a very effective way of provoking Palestinians uh, and, and thereby making that the reason uh, for, for further uh, indignities and humiliations to be heaped on them. So, sort of, um, this is um, reminiscent of what the Warsaw Ghetto was. We are done with this. We no longer want to take this on. And we somehow or the other want to register our protest against it. Um, it, it results in the death of um, a th thousand uh, Israelis, most of whom um, uh, in, in, in the best of situations would possibly have had sympathized with the Arabs uh, and, and possibly would not have had on their own been a uh, reason for any provocation against them um, at, at their own individual levels. Uh, that's 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 the cost that nationalism exacts from people uh, in in terms of um, uh, enforcing an, uh, a national identity, and that that leaves us uh, wondering and thinking in so many different ways as to uh, what can be the way out as far as this entire situation is concerned. Um, Hamas started life in the prisons of Israel in the 1980s. As an organization uh, whose coming into existence was encouraged by the Israeli uh, armed forces as well as by the Israeli government, uh, so that what could be done is there could be a counter to the PLO, the Palestinian National, uh, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which had been spearheading the Palestinian struggle since the 1960s when it was formed. Uh, by the 1980s had turned itself into sort of the sole voice of the Palestinian people across the world. Uh, Yasser Arafat uh, delivering that memorable speech to the United Nations General Assembly for which the General Assembly moves from uh, New York to Switzerland given the fact that the Americans refused to uh, grant him a visa uh, for the occasion is, is the sort of thing that comes to mind when one thinks about it. So uh, the, the PLO establishes itself as a sole voice of the Palestinian people and somehow or the other Israel is looking out for a way by which uh, Israel, Israel could make a dent into it and sort of create a division between them. And along the way comes uh, this idea that uh, Palestinian youngsters who are um, uh, jailed in Israeli jails, um, can, can they be put together uh, in an effort to take on the PLO? Uh, so as opposed to a more 20th century version or mid 20th century version of a more secular, of a more uh, leftist sort of nationalism, uh, Hamas emerges as a more uh, fundamentalist, uh, more Islamist sort of organization, uh, which which uh, shares its kinship in terms of ideas and ideals with the Equinal Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt. Uh, and, and it's clear about this that if at all it comes into power, it would enforce the Sharia in, in terms of whatever it understands to be the Sharia uh, across territories that would be under its control. Um, the, the, the Israeli game plan works. Over the years, Hamas systematically goes about um, chipping away at the legitimacy of the PLO. And once the PLO enters into uh, uh, the, the treaties that it signs with the Israeli government of the 1990s, uh, and, and uh, whose enforcement results in the establishment of the Palestinian National Authority, there's a gradual realization among Palestinians that the Oslo Accords have not delivered much on the ground as far as the lives of average and common Palestinians are concerned. And it's there uh, that, that um, Hamas comes into the picture. So, uh, 1987 to 89 is a period in which um, Hamas is sort of incubated in the Israeli jails. 1994 is when the Oslo Accords are signed in Washington. Um, 95 is when Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin is shot dead on the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, by 2000, it's clear to anyone who has eyes that um, the PLO has got trapped in a game of its own. And possibly Israel is not keen on what is called as a meaningful sharing of sovereignty with the Palestinians. Uh, 2003, Yasser Arafat is dead. 2005, Hamas wins the elections. 2006, Israel walks out of Gaza. 
from 2006 to 2023 there have been seven episodes of a confrontation between the israeli defense forces and um, uh, hamas as far as gaza itself is concerned the latest one being in 2021 when almost 210 palestinians are killed 250 palestinians are killed over a 10-day period that one lasted for 10 days one doesn't know as to how long is this one supposed to go on and then you have this one in 2023 in in terms of each one of the earlier episodes uh, the causes of provocation were, um, a, a, as far as the IDF is concerned, um, not as spectacular as the one that has happened on the 7th of October is concerned, uh, which, which is um, something that is completely different. Uh, there are uh, significant voices that are um, sort of talking about it in hushed tones in uh, Israeli defense as well as Israeli intelligence itself, that it does seem that something on this scale is, is uh, not a routine failure of intelligence as far as the Israeli intelligence authorities are concerned. Um, uh, Israeli intelligence across the region is famed for being on its toes. Uh, when, when it comes to listening carefully uh, and understanding as to what are the Palestinians exactly up to. So it, it sort of seems that um, they, they have done their job well, but um, the information that they have ferreted on the ground, uh, when it has made its way to the officers of the government, uh, there seems to be some problem at that end. So to a lot of people in the Israeli intelligence community, uh, community, it seems to be a matter of lapse as far as working on this intelligence is concerned at the government end, rather than at the end of uh, the intelligence officials themselves. Uh, most of them are clear about this, that they, they possibly have warned the government that something like this is afoot and something like this might happen. Uh, most Israeli um, defense um, uh, initiatives were targeted towards the Lansden uh, organization in the Nablus region in the West Bank. So they, they, they were, were looking at organizations like Lansden that were trying to take on the PLO in uh, the West Bank region. And so it seems that um, Hamas stayed much under the radar. Uh, but then they're equally clear about this, that yes, they were definitely in the know of something like this that Hamas can perpetrate. Uh, but, but it seems that uh, the sort of action that was required at the government end is possibly lacking in all of this. Why? Well, there, it's, it's a wild guess that anyone and everyone can make. Uh, but some of it has got to do with the fact that uh, ever since the Netanyahu government has tried to sort of whittle down uh, the independence of the Israeli judiciary and tried to make the judiciary almost a wing of the government. Uh, there have been massive protests and demonstrations against this in Israel itself, which have been going on for months now. Um, the Netanyahu government hasn't budged from its position uh, and has pursued its, its efforts of trying to bring the judiciary as much under its control as is possible. Has got to do with Prime Minister Netanyahu's corruption trial and in, in any sort of a functioning judiciary be it of the variety that was in existence uh, before the Netanyahu bills were passed in the Knesset or after the bills uh, were passed in the Knesset, uh, all evidence is overwhelming and all evidence is compelling about the fact that um, if, if at all anything can be done uh, in, in the right spirit of justice, Prime Minister Netanyahu needs to go to jail. So it's it's a um, uh, uh, government, a battered government, headed by a bitter politician uh, who is uh, trying to escape imminent imprisonment um, and, and is battling an unbelievable social divide on account of all of this. So for the last couple of months, Israel is a divided society. Uh, Israelis are a divided people. Out there on the streets, it's for the whole world to see that they are a divided people. Uh, they, they are just not able to come to terms with each other. Uh, there is bad blood. There is all, all sorts of insinuations. Uh, there is this um, strong, strong uh, sort of sentiment on the side of those opposing the Prime Minister that this is not just about saving the Prime Minister. This is not just about reforming the judiciary as, as the Prime Minister says. But this essentially is something that is going to strike at the very roots of the state of Israel and is going to create a more fundamental question for a lot of people in Israel as to what does it mean to be a Jew. 
So at the end of the day, it seems that the Netanyahu government is lurching significantly to the extreme right, wherein uh, the ultra-Orthodox would take up all sorts of uh, positions of authority and from those positions of authority dictate as to what does it mean to be a Jew, what's the right way of being a Jew. And that's, that's something that most Israelis are, are uh, extremely uh, bitter about and are strongly opposed to. So Israel till the 7th of October represented the picture of a people and a society that was severely divided. Uh, come 7th of October and this episode and now what you have is uh, a sort of uh, cohesion that is papering over all those divides that that's uh, that that's pulling people close to each other uh, with, with this idea that um, our very survival is at stake if, if something like this can happen to perfectly innocent people um, uh, ju just just imagine as to if you let it go without a challenge what sort of problems are you going to go ahead and face so politicians who oppose the Prime Minister in the Knesset are now eager to become a part of a grand national unity government which would be headed by the Prime Minister. Something which is again being opposed by a lot of Israelis. So no less than a reputed uh, uh, paper like the Harrods um, has even as late as uh, uh, three days after the episode um, columnists who are arguing for the Prime Minister's resignation and right in the middle of this conflict that uh, we shouldn't delay this any further the Netanyahu government has failed the Israelis as far as their security is concerned and it's the right thing that can be done by Prime Minister Netanyahu is to just step down from his position now and here itself and let somebody else head the government and let somebody else head this initiative against Hamas. So for all the strong talk and bluster uh, on, on display, there's this very strong and powerful idea that uh, some, somehow or the other, the government has failed the people and the people possibly deserve something much more better than this. Uh, how would the Israeli uh, politi uh, political dynamic play out? Well, that's anybody's guess. Um, the divisions uh, sort of persist even at this late hour. Uh, where where uh, United Front is being called in for all across the place and and you you have uh, people talking in so many strong uh, voices about things um, as as far as both the occupied territories are concerned as well as the state of Israel itself is concerned. Uh, uh, almost 250 people out of these 1,000, that's um, uh, the single largest number of people who were killed at a single episode, uh, were killed as far as the Noah Music Festival is concerned, um, parting late night, um, early into the morning, um, youngsters who are a part of a music festival um, on the day when the Shabbat has started uh, and are hence a um, very strong moral problem as far as ultra-orthodoxy are concerned, are the people who have lost the most lives, are the people from whom uh, the, the largest number of people have been kidnapped. Uh, by, by the Hamas uh, fighters. So uh, all, all in all this presents a strange predicament for the state of Israel as to what needs to be done now and henceforth. Um, three lakh uh, reservists have been called into service. Um, they have marched uh, in accordance with their call of duty. Uh, Gaza stands besieged from all sides and uh, it, it seems that there is a uh, invasion, a land invasion which is imminent uh, except for the fact that there are a sufficient number of voices within the security establishment which are equally clear about this that a land invasion can entrap the IDF into a battle of uh, its choice but possibly there would be no way of easily extricating ourselves out of it. So Gaza being the sort of densely populated place that it is uh, six, uh, approximately 6,500 people per square kilometer. Uh, there is rarely a part of the world which is as densely populated as Gaza is, um, whose air, whose, whose uh, water, whose electricity, whose fuel, whose food, whose medicine supplies have been completely stopped by the government of Israel. So uh, Israel has stopped every every single thing uh, moving from Israel towards Gaza has been stopped. Uh, telecommunication towers within Gaza are being demolished 
uh, at, at a very rapid pace, thereby seeing to it that Gazans are not in a position to upload any content which the world can take cognizance of. Uh, and, and the other big thing that is happening is this very eminent sort of land blockade. Uh, it's uh, except for the Rafa crossing on the Egyptian side, practically everything now is besieged by uh, the Israelis. Um, Gaza also is a very interesting territory in the sense that um, beneath the ground of Gaza is possibly the world's most extensive and most complicated uh, network of, of tunnels that, that uh, crisscrosses the entire territory and that mostly moves towards uh, Rafa and the Sinai, uh, where, from whence um, Gazans derive a lot of their sustenance, um, stuff that they keep trading, necessities for life, medicines, food. Um, but there, there are cases where the tunnels are so big that you can have vehicles stuffed with goods moving in and out. So, and that, that possibly is the only way by which um, uh, Gazans are trying to survive as of now. Uh, the, the, the Sinai is a hotbed of the Ikhwan. Uh, the Sinai is a region which um, has a lot of Egyptians who are very sympathetic to the Gazans. And it seems that uh, in, in any final stand between the Israelis and uh, Hamas, uh, this this networking under the ground is something that is going to play a very pivotal role, and and that's uh, most most of the hostages are possibly being held in the tunnels below uh, Gaza, and that is the complexity that the Israeli defense forces are trying to in some way or the other navigate. Uh, that well entering Gaza might be easy. But moving out of Gaza uh, in, with, with the sense that uh, we have accomplished most of our goals might be the most difficult part of the entire story. Uh, they have past episodes wherein uh, they, they know for sure that um, long distance targeting of Gaza is much more easier, um, is, is uh, much more uh, feasible as compared to uh, actual invasion, a boots on the ground sort of an approach. Uh, which which uh, sort of complicates matters for the Israeli army and they're just not interested in this any further. Uh, the Hamas plan is to bargain the refugees for the approximately uh, 6,000 Palestinians being held in various uh, Israeli prisons and possibly use it as a bargaining chip to bring this uh, entire conflict to a close. Um, Hamas seems to have been blessed by the Russians as far as this part of the episode is concerned, knowing fully well that um, the Western alliance, which is supporting Ukraine in its war against Russia, would now find itself further strained when it comes to supporting Israel in its struggle against um, uh, Hamas. Uh, but then, of course, Russia is trying to uh, sort of stretch um, uh, Western support, Western resources, all across the place, uh, including with what they have done in the Armenian case. Uh, it, it seems that they are deliberately trying to provoke situations uh, wherein uh, Western resolve and resources would both stand as stretched in this conflict as is possible. Uh, Iran seems to have played some sort of role in this, though no one is clear as to what exactly is that all about. Uh, Iran is uh, Hamas's um, immediate sucker in terms of the fact that uh, they provide them with funds, they provide them with arsenal, they provide them with necessary military training, they provide them with uh, smart ways of communication, uh, they, they provide them with the very wherewithal with which uh, you, you can take on an army like the Israeli army uh, and um, at least for a reasonable period of time you can stand around. So, uh, knowing that, it, it, it's quite easy to bring this into the picture that, well, the Iranians are playing a role in all of this. Uh, but what role is it exactly that they have played in this one? Well, that is something that is unclear. And at least the Israelis have thrown up their hands in despair saying that, uh, well, we doubt it, but we are not able to substantiate anything as of now. Uh, so that's, that's where things um, get, get extremely complicated and very, very interesting. Um, the Chinese um, are, are uh, stretched to their optimum and, and possibly in this case, uh, given the fact that uh, they, they neither have bridges with the Israelis or with the Palestinians, are not much in a position to offer the same sort of help that they are offered in the Saudi-Iranian case uh, as far as this one is concerned. 
and it seems that um, as, as has been pointed out time and again by all sorts of analysts on all sides of this entire story uh, Israelis as well as non-Israelis um, that, that um, no amount of uh, peacemaking with the Arabs is going to help until and unless there isn't a reasonable solution to the Palestinian crisis. So you, you have people who have pointed this out in the past that, that all sorts of uh, Abraham Accord activities are always going to fail. They are, they are, they are bound to sort of uh, flounder on this rock that is called the Palestinian question. So until and unless uh, Israel doesn't come up with a reasonable, workable solution to the Palestinian issue, uh, no amount of shaking hands, establishing peace, doing pe uh, commerce, sending out tourists and, and exchanging uh, well-wishers between Israel and n number of Arab countries, Sudan to the United Arab Emirates, all that you can think of is going to work until and unless you don't try resolving the Palestinian issue. Netanyahu broke free from Ariel Sharon after uh, the Sharon government decided to uh, withdraw the settlers and the settlements from Gaza. Uh, the Netanyahu camp believes that um, the Bible is absolutely right in terms of uh, granting this piece of land to the Jewish people. And what the Jewish people by their, um, by, by their efforts have got to do is to see to it that this uh, uh, gift of God is sort of realized on the ground uh, by your own efforts. You, you have got to lay claim to every rock and piece of stone that you can. Uh, you have got to stand by it. You have got to defend your claim. And if necessary, you have got to fight for it. And, and uh, for the matter of fact, even Ariel Sharon never believed in a two-state solution. Um, and the Netanyahu government definitely doesn't believe. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is um, someone who is um, a man inspired by something deeply messianic, uh, which insists on this, that uh, no piece of Israeli territory would ever be Palestinian. So there is never going to be a Palestinian state. If Israelis stand united, there's quite a possibility that uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip uh, would, would be merged into Israeli territory, would become Israeli territories, and the Palestinians can be given an uh, offer of being second-class citizens or leave to the Arab countries surrounding Israel. So that's, that's the larger Netanyahu game plan. There can never be a Palestinian state. There never was one and there never would be one. Is, is what they are deeply and absolutely clear about. The one small problem is the Palestinians are not on board. So, and, and stay up, as of now where they are, a people abandoned by the whole world, a people who possibly have, have no one who sympathizes with them, a people who, whose, whose fate almost stands sealed in the way in which it does, fighting all by themselves, just as Jews did during the Second World War just as Jews did under the Nazis. It's, it's just not different. One is definitely not making a claim that uh, the Jews are a Nazi people. Definitely not. It's, it's just that all, all sorts of authoritarian governments uh, who are convinced about uh, a, a certain sort of divine mandate that has been given to them, uh, who believe in, in, in those types of old world ideas of nationalism, are bound to behave in certain ways which sound to be so similar. So there's definitely no one in their right minds would ever try making that sort of uh, claim or would ever try drawing that sort of line. But the reasons uh, why, why one should never do it uh, are, are completely different. For, for all, all the claims that the Europeans and the Americans make in terms of standing by Israel, it seems that to a certain extent they, they stand by Israel, they arm Israel. Uh, the Americans provide $2 billion every year in military assistance to the Israelis. 60 lakh Israelis, uh, 60 lakh Jews who are provided with that sort of assistance. Bipartisan support. You, you also had Bernie Sanders people now talking in the United States that we were possibly wrong about this entire idea of the Palestinian struggle. Sad, absolute sad. So you have Europeans, you have Americans 
you have the white man standing behind the Jews solidly with this idea that um, buddy do what you want in this part of the world we would always be there to support you to condone you but possibly the one small thing do not ever come back to Europe do not ever come back to the United States do not settle amongst us stay away from us stay with the land that you now have do what you want with the Palestinian people and, 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 and we are not worried. Our, our consciences are, are just not scratched. Even if you go about killing two-month-old toddlers, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't ever come back and become a part of who we are. There's a subtle, strong and definite anti-Semitism that pervades every European and American government's efforts of trying to appear to be on the side of Israel. Even in this case, it seems to be so strongly and but so subtly driven by a certain sense of anti-Semitism. So the very fact that Americans and Europeans after 75 years have not been able to resolve this matter militarily, have not been able to in some way or the other bring Israel around to the point that there is possibly never going to be a military solution to this crisis and one doesn't need to go very further to understand as to why can there be no military solution. Jewish history is ample proof of it. You try destroying a people, you cannot. It's not possible. It can never be done. So just as the Nazis for all the efforts that they made in this world could not destroy the Jewish people. For all the efforts that the state of Israel is going to make with all the military assistance that it receives from the world, it is never ever going to be in a position to destroy the Palestinian people. It's a fact, plain and simple. And we have got to come around to this point. We have got, it's late, it's pretty late. 75 years is too big a period of time to let this go on and on and on in the way in which it has gone on and on and on and on. Average common Palestinians have given up on the idea that there ever would be a viable Palestinian state which would come into existence. The two-state solution for most Palestinians is an abandoned solution. It is unworkable. It's never going to be realized. All that they are looking out for is a life of equity, a life of dignity, a life of justice within whatever is now left behind. Possibly with the Jews themselves. And, and you just cannot do this in any other way. So all, all this flying over all over the place in terms of uh, trying to realize the Abraham Accords is an unworkable thing. The last chip of the block was the Britain government's efforts to bring the Israelis as close to the Saudis as is possible. Mohammed bin Salman being the sort of shrewd person that he is, trying to play the sort of games that he is with this idea that well he is ready to establish peace with the Israelis provided the Americans are ready to give him a civil nuclear program almost on a platter. So even while dealing with the Americans about Israel and the Palestinian people, Mohammed bin Salman is trying to play the Iran game as smartly as is possible. So if the Iranians have a nuclear program, which the Americans have not been able to demolish and finish off, let the Saudis have one of their own. Israeli security analysts are pretty clear about this, that come whatever happens, Mohammed bin Salman should not get a nuclear program. For the Israelis, dealing with one nuclear state in the region, that's Iran, is enough of a trouble. Having another one close by would possibly be a disaster. So they're very clear about this. And Mohammed bin Salman is equally clear about this. And until and unless the Saudis don't get a nuclear program, well-established nuclear program, he is not going to reach to any sort of conclusion as far as the Saudi Israeli episode of the Abraham Accords is concerned. He's not interested in it. Hamas and average Palestinians know this for sure, that if the Israeli-Saudi rapprochement becomes a reality, they are doomed people, a completely doomed people. After that, there can never be any talk of Palestine. That's the way in which the struggle has evolved 
over the last almost seven decades, starting off from the high point of nationalism, of Arab nationalism, under the leadership of President Nasser, way back in the 1950s. This is where the uh, Palestinian struggle has now come this far. That you started off with um, Egypt, you started off with Syria, you started off with Iraq, and now it's the Saudis who hold a veto as far as um, the Palestinian uh, statehood issue is concerned. And hence, for Hamas, the urgency that we have got to act. We've got to do something here and now. And, and that's what they go ahead and do. Unarmed, peaceful civilians who on a day of prayer and reflection have never ever anticipated their lives would be cut short and their lives would be devastated in the way in which they have been. The Israeli Defense Minister Yao Galant says that in the Gaza what the Israeli Defense Forces are fighting against are human animals. Another sad way by which Israel tries to delegitimize the very existence of the Palestinian people. The oldest thing that any, any playbook of war will throw at you is to keep insisting on this that, well, uh, my rival, exactly speaking, is not human. So once, once I uh, establish this, uh, the, the, the Rwandan equivalent of uh, this is um, the Hutus insisting on the Tutsis being nothing but cockroaches that need to be finished off. So something very similar. I, I, I deny humanity to my rivals whereby it becomes killing them with no blemish on my conscience as easy as is possible. Would there be peace after that? Possibly never. This week also happens to be the week in which um, the eminent Indologist Patrick Oliver has come out with a new biography of uh, Emperor Ashok, who is quite the flavor of the season as far as uh, the Indian history world is concerned. There have been studies on Ashok, there have been studies on uh, Ashok's um, state, society, um, that have been published by um, academic historians um, and, and people who are historians. And, and um, Patrick Oliver's Ashok once again sort of induces that old reflection that Emperor Ashok had almost 20 centuries ago, uh, 25, 20, uh, 23 centuries ago, that war, even the most devastating one, in which you have triumphed, possibly doesn't bring matters to a close. It resolves nothing. It, it, it destroys on scale, but it possibly is no solution to any of the problems that you have. You've got to try it differently. Thank you. Mm -hmm.